Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us today as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Computer Science Department. Um, as you may know, we are the first computer science department in the Northern Hemisphere. And turns out, <laughs> it turns out we may have to drop that qualification because we might be the oldest existing computer science in the world. We're unable to locate the other department on the internet. That probably means they're gone. <laughs> So um, they have, they have the, a true claim that they had the first PhD in computer science, but we had the first degree granting program on the books. So they cheated. They took a math PhD student and said, take a CS degree. OK, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, it's actually, as you must agree, uh, it's truly remarkable how far the field has come and the impact it has had in the short history of 50 years, which in terms of academic disciplines is really a very short amount of time. So today we're going to commemorate the event with four distinguished talks, and we'll start with a talk by Professor Deborah Estrin. Uh, she is a professor of computer science at the newly minted um, Cornell New York, uh, Cornell campus at uh, Cornell Tech, Cornell Tech campus at New York City. And she's also a professor of uh, medical, uh, sorry, a professor of public health at the Weill Cornell um, Medical College. She is a co-founder of the nonprofit Open M Health, and she's also very well known for her earlier work in um, network sensing, where she was a, the founding uh, director of the NSF Center on Embedded Network Sensing at UCLA. She is an elected member of the American Academy for Arts and Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So her more recent focus is on, on, public, on medical health, uh, on mobile health, sorry, and that's what she's going to be talking about today. And I'd like to ask you to join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for being one of the few people that actually said the name of that center correctly. So uh, you know you've named something poorly when most people permute it in some wrong way. So in fact was, I'm getting a horrible echo. How are you? I sh okay, I'll try to ignore. Um, it's horrible when you're forced to listen to yourself. <clears throat> uh, so just before I begin, uh, I was looking at the little uh, cheat sheet of history uh, about your department. And uh, yes, I'm by now sort of a older senior computer scientist, um, but I, I think I will never really think of myself that way because I grew up. My history around the history of computer science goes way back before then because I was raised by computer scientists. And um, it's particularly on my mind these days, just uh, a week ago, um, I don't know why I do this to myself at the beginning of talks, um, just a week ago was the year marker of my father's passing on March 29th um, at 90. A wonderful life. Any of you knew him is a, a, a wonderful man. And uh, he went to, he and my mother both went to UCLA um, after a stint in Israel, building the first computer there in the Middle East in the early 50s. And around uh, 55, 56, something like that, they went to UCLA uh, because von Neumann, who they had worked with at the Institute for Advanced Study, was going to RAND. He never got there because he developed cancer and never got to LA, but they ended up at UCLA, which wasn't one of the first computer science departments because there were no departments. It was one integrated school of engineering. Um, one integrated school of engineering where my father got an appointment and my mother couldn't because there were nepotism laws that uh, husband and wife couldn't be in the same, it was all one big department. So lots of interesting uh, history there, but I was raised around the early a computer scientist, so how could I be a senior computer scientist? I don't know how that happened. Uh, but it was really interesting to look along that history, and of course, as somebody in computer science, Purdue has always been there. I never particularly paid attention to the fact that it was the first, but it makes a lot of sense now because it was always that, uh, um, that, uh, that institution of, of excellence in the uh, academic uh, framework of, of computer science. So. And then more recently, um, my most recent chair at UCLA uh, but, um, that I, d I just left uh, in, uh, in January, Jens Paulsberg, 
um, of course, came from uh, here. And my most recent, recent PhD student, who just finally finished, um, was a transfer who came along with Yen at the time from Purdue. So there are my uh, many, many points of connection uh, back to the campus. So uh, what I wanted to tell you some about um, uh, today was some of the things that I've been doing over the past decade plus that in one way or another center around mobile computing. And I guess you could call it research. It's probably more exploration. And uh, <clears throat> that really uh, takes a very applied, iterative uh, approach to exploring new directions uh, on the edges of, of, of computing technology. And I'll uh, end up talking a lot about mobile, but I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how I got to that. So I'll tell you uh, some about how I transitioned from doing more embedded wireless sensor networks to mobile and what we call participatory sensing, how uh, mobile health is current very strong focus, and that uh, a little bit, you know, the play on words in terms of research in everyday life, how it is that I think uh, some of these mobile technologies can play into the way we care for ourselves and do research because they provide us with personal evidence about our own health. Some of the things I'm, I'm doing next, and I'll end with a bit of a um, recognition of my uh, advisors, uh, Jerry Seltzer's early, early um, and I pr think pretty seminal paper with, with colleagues on end-to-end uh, -end arguments in, in system design and use that as sort of a rationale for the kind of work I like to do. So uh, let me just say, and I'm, I'm saying this not because there are people who are affiliated with NSF in the audience, um, that I had the incredible fortune of getting to build and run and sunset. That's not the, that's not the part that's most fun. Um, an NSF Science and Technology Center. And it started with, uh, I was doing internet protocol design for the first dozen more 15 years of my, uh, of my uh, academic uh, life out of graduate school. So I went to graduate school at MIT, was around uh, Dave Clark and the folks who were really part of the early ITF community. So I was very much weaned on um, this, uh, this incredible um, stimulation you get from being part of a big collaborative community of people who are doing things that really have impact and that are getting used along uh, along the path. And that's what the IETF and internet protocol design was like in those days. But it was a much harder thing to have influence on in, as we got to the mid and later 90s. The internet, that process succeeded so wildly <laughs> that it became harder to have influence on the protocols that were actually run in the internet. So it was harder to be an academic and a practical academic thinking that Look, a lot of what I've done never has seen the light of day, right? And I don't expect everything to see the light of day. But if I know up front that there's no chance that this is going to have any, any um, impact in practice, I just lose interest. I have great respect for theoreticians. I use a lot of theory, but I'm not one. I'm sort of inherently, um, I'm inherently driven by sort of pragmatism and application. And that's what drives me. Uh, so. The internet was getting harder and harder to influence. Spent all this time designing multicast routing protocols, and then nobody was willing to deploy them. And it's not because they were idiots. It's because there was plenty of bandwidth out there, and it was a management nightmare. And so sort of in response to that trauma, now multicast is actually sort of getting deployed, but I'm not a very patient person. So it's sort of in response to that trauma of designing multicast, I said, well, I have to start doing something differently that there's a chance I can influence. I was on the ISAP board at the time and started thinking about what became, in the community, sort of wireless sensor networks. And we started off with these early themes of thousands. Actually, um, we probably said hundreds of thousands. We probably said millions. If I wasn't uh, embarrassed by it, I would go back to my old PowerPoint slides, and I would be able to see how every successive talk, I would knock off an order of magnitude from the estimates of the numbers of sensors that would be out there. And every time, and that knocking off that order of magnitude, instead of scaling up, came to happen because I started actually doing distributed sensing and working with people who had the need for using distributed sensing systems. So we started off with this grand, relatively abstract vision 
of massive numbers of small devices, autonomous operation, and it was a great context in which to come up with ideas for distributed algorithms and things like that. It was a great driver for computer science ideas. But what the NSF STC program gave me the opportunity to do was to actually bring a class of target applications into the design room with us. And once I actually had the ecologists and the environmental engineers and the marine biologists and the seismologists, not just as somebody I would go and sort of get you know, the introductory paragraph for a proposal idea from, but really in the room saying, how could we design a new class of distributed instruments to let you do your science or your engineering differently? Once they were actually in the room, well, they didn't want to leave behind their higher end instruments that actually did have a lot more fidelity to them. They didn't want to leave, uh, they didn't, um, they knew a lot about what it was to actually build a soil chemistry sensor, right, and how many of them you could actually deploy next to one another and how long it would be before they would get fouled. There were lots of um, messy but reality problems that caused us to um, retarget what we were doing and not be so, um, uh, 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 not be so rigid about saying, unless it's about thousands of autonomous, simple devices, we as computer scientists, that's the computer science problem and that's the problem I'm going to solve. That's how I entered the space. And as I started working with these people with real applications, I started to say, okay, no, I actually have a center and we're going to work on solving your problems and have some faith that out of those will come more challenges. Um, Margaret uh, Martinosi was once on a panel and said something that I think I've probably now repeated a hundred more times than, than she has. She said that multidisciplinary research is about taking turns. You can't go out with the most avant-garde, uh, uncertain computer science approach and their applied problem that they're actually trying to collect new data on at the same time. There's too much uncertainty. You have to take turns. You go out with something you sort of understand, you take that into the field, to understand what the scientists need, and then you say, ah, and what's the innovation that I could go and try to apply differently to that data set or in that context? If you try to do both things at once, it's hard to make progress on either. You don't know what ground truth is. There is too much uncertainty. You don't get the best uh, scientists or PhD students from the applied field to come with you because they're not going to be able to do their science with your very uncertain set of instruments. And at the beginning of SENS, the center that we built, I didn't get that, right? I only heard Margaret on that panel who sort of crystallized that notion uh, some years in. But in that process, because this center gives you this 10 years, if you get renewal, right, enough scope of funding and enough time to go through this process of actually iterating and trying to do things, uh, trying to do things differently, not just sort of do different things. We started working with a much wider array of devices and small devices in combination and also recognizing that we were doing human assistance uh, more, than, more than complete autonomy. And why isn't this working? Where am I supposed to be pointing it? It worked a moment ago. Hmm. Does this work? Yes. Okay. When you have a hardwired connection, you use it. You only use wireless when you have no choice. Okay. So uh, as we went on with that process, and this is the beginning of, uh, of that move into mobile, one of the things that, I was, uh, that we were struck with was embedded sensing is great. It gives you far more spatial resolution than remote sensing technologies. It gives you more temporal continuity than uh, scientists coming in and doing um, grab samples and just manual measurements. But there's this real opportunity cost to just placing a sensor somewhere on the planet and measuring that point uh, because your sensor is placed there and not somewhere else. Because sensing isn't actually free. So many things about uh, digital uh, hardware and Moore's Law, many things have become virtually free, uh, but transducers not so. Not because the hardware is necessarily expensive, although in some cases it is, um, but the placement of sensors is important, the calibration 
uh, the cleaning. The, because they're very coupled with the physical environment, the many aspects of actual physical sensing doesn't have the characteristics of memory and of bandwidth and of computation in terms of being able to think about them as being, as being uh, virtually free. So we started looking at, we really want mobile sensing to be able to move through the field of interest, not just have fixed place sensors. Because there's, a, there's this sort of opportunity cost in economist terms of just leaving a sensor in one point. That better be a really important point on the Earth's surface that you want to continuously measure. So we started with another NSF project uh, called NIMS on looking at robotic sensors that would move through a field and also because they would have an energy source be able to have that higher end class of sensors uh, on them. And uh, that was sort of the beginning of my move into this area of mobile. So um, we were past our, uh, maybe even going into our mid-year mark um, with the center. And still, and through the lifetime of the center, did a lot of work in environmental and ecological and marine and seismic, um, the, the domains that we, were, uh, that we were initially targeted on. But NSF and the center process also encourages you to adapt and to what in the startup community they refer to as pivot, right? That you get to a place and you realize that the opportunity is over there, as most startups, uh, as most startups do. And we, we didn't know that term then, but we really did a sort of pivot at the center with a fair amount of our work because what happened is that these devices started emerging. So we had been doing distributed sensing, we started doing mobile sensing, and then these things came along. And uh, we looked at these things as distributed mobile sensors. Right? They started as communication devices, and we started with these things when they didn't look like this. But with the first round of really uh, the Nokia devices, they were based in Symbian, but they started being programmable. They had pretty good cameras in them. Uh, they had Wi-Fi. Uh, and when we started, they still had, they had Bluetooth. You could talk to a GPS that was Bluetooth connected to the device. And we started looking at this opportunity for individuals to be able to do systematic data collection about their urban environments uh, and really built on a long history in the social sciences uh, that's referred to as experience sampling and photo voice, uh, that both of which were somewhat before their time because people weren't walking around instrumented then. They had to give people those instruments. And the idea was to be able to give everyday people the opportunity to have real time, real context um, ability to create data around a particular uh, topic. And uh, in this context, as we started doing more with mobile phones, there was a real um, focus on starting with problems that scaled down. Okay, now the only time we usually like scaling down in computer science is when we're talking about like microelectronics, right? We like things to become smaller and smaller. But in the systems aspects and data aspects of computer science, we usually want things to scale up, right? We don't want those zeros to be coming off, right? We want them to be going on. But as, a, as, somebody, as people trying to do experimental work in a field, you have to, I have to be able to actually do experiments. I don't want to just do experiments in a lab that prove my point. I actually want to learn from trying to do something actually. Um, and in order to do something actually, I have to be able to afford to do it. So let me give you a concrete example of what I mean. One of the first uh, master's projects in an early class in, in like 2006 that we did in mobile, in this mobile data collection, was uh, one of the students with a GPS external to the phone collected GPS, I was in LA, as they were driving. Right? As a way, if you get GPS time series, you can get an estimate of how the traffic is moving on uninstrumented roads. And it was a, <coughs> a cool project, a cool idea. It was good for a class project. But what do you do after that? You, obviously, you can reason about the fact that in order for something like that to work, you have to have some base of penetration in a city. 
so that you have some reasonable probability of your getting data from the uninstrumented streets for that to be a good measure of what the traffic will look like. How in a, that sort of academic context as just a, a project, right, would we get even 1 or 2 percent penetration and in Los Angeles of all places, right? It's not a dense place. People come from all over the place. And so we looked at it and said, that's cool, but I don't have any real way to pursue it outside of sort of simulation and modeling land. Now, interestingly enough, does this raise, uh, does anyone, can anyone know the projects that have actually, this is real now, right? So, yep. yes, exactly. So uh, the startup that did this, by the way, is Waze. So there's a startup out of, uh, actually out of Israel from several years ago. And um, in some cities, in some parts of the world where people use Waze, and it's one of these things that once it gets to about, in a, in a dense region, in a dense city, once it gets to about 2%, it becomes the authoritative source of traffic information. And it's just by people in their cars turning on ways. And uh, it contributes this real time, actual, how is the traffic moving on these streets from the cars that are moving along. Uh, um, Alex Bayen at Berkeley did a great project called Mobile Millennium, where he actually got hundreds of undergrads from Berkeley to drive cars up and down the 280 to try out some of the uh, models for how you actually uh, compute this data. But we looked at this and said, OK, but can these data actually be useful to smaller scale problems that scale down, that are useful one person at a time? And for the most part, what I've been doing since then are projects that don't require large scale penetration, but that provide utility even in small adoption. Because if you can get utility at small adoption, then there's a chance of actually scaling up. So don't be thinking about large scale epidemiology problems, right? That I can see who's interacting with whom. Eventually, this stuff will apply to that big data, big network. Think about what you can learn, what an individual can learn, what data they can contribute a person at a time. So we did experiment, we did projects like uh, giving to uh, a, communi a community in LA was putting in a big, a uh, proposal for where to place interventions for youth. And so they use these, uh, this participatory sensing uh, methodology and, and software on a bunch of, uh, of smartphones. By now we're up, to, we're up to Androids to collect data from participating teens, where they spend their time, and what do their days look like. And they pass this collection of phones around the, around the community, because at the time ma many fewer had, uh, had smartphones. And with passive data collection on their mobility, as well as active prompting, who are you walking with on your way to school? What did you eat this morning for breakfast? Um, what's, you know, what are the major impediments to you doing your homework right now in the evening? It was just a scripted set of, uh, of, of self-report with images. And they did this really large scale data collection, very distributed way. No um, digital divide with respect to socioeconomics, a digital divide with respect to age. So their parents weren't as comfortable with this. We focused on the teens. Just as an example, so the idea is it's not just a like flicker. You, do, you collect data, and afterwards you author it. You have particular data you want to know. Get that campaign out to your community. Get them collecting data for a few days. It can be on people running traffic lights. It can be on teens being uh, harassed with jaywalking tickets, You know whatever the issue might be in, in your particular neighborhood. We have a large um, math science partnership project with LA Unified School District. Uh, the second largest school district in the country. I'm now in the city with the largest school district in the country. Um, and uh, we're using this whole idea of participatory sensing to engage high school students who are taking an exploring, uh, exploring computer science class to introduce them to data and engage them with data by letting them collect data around their own life and then learn data analysis tools and some visualization tools to look at that data. So this is just an, an, an example um, of uh, data that they collected around their snacking behavior. Um, and we did things uh, that had to do with like, why are you eating this snack as well? And they can play with things like word clouds as well as, as other kinds of uh, analysis uh, techniques. Um, the point of it is to learn around data. The engagement point is to let that data be something that they actually have some sense about and, and engagement with. Um, not exactly in chronological order, but somewhere along the line, 
Um, we were doing a lot of things with this, uh, with image capture on these phones. We're actually doing a first project on trying to do automated capture of, of food intake. By We had these outward facing Nokia cameras, again, it, uh, phones, it was long before iPhones and things, that were programmed to take pictures every 10 seconds. And it was, uh, and, um, and uh, then we did, used computer vision techniques, image processing to filter down to just the meal based things to let sort of people look at at their three-day inventory on what their food intake was about. It was one of those projects that um, uh, it was so privacy awkward to be walking around with an outward-facing camera for most of us, right? We didn't want to use it at home, right? Your family's running around half-dressed, and it's just a very awkward thing to be, for mo you know, if you're not one of those wearable people, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an awkward thing to do. And so what happened with that, though, is that I just, the, and particularly for me, I sort of would grab a protein bar or an apple or something like that. The, food, the, the pictures were all of my steering wheel during my commute, right, and of these, you know, pieces of fruit coming in and out of the images. They weren't particularly telling. But what was really interesting is for the first time, I started to have a continuous trace of my GPS, of my location. In those days, you only got uh, uh, location from GPS. Now there are a bunch of uh, lower uh, energy ways to, to augment that. And so we lo started looking at this question, well, if I can personalize information that's out there about me with my spatiotemporal trace, what can that tell me? For example, can it tell me about my exposure, again, I was in LA, can it tell me about my exposure to air pollution? So the city runs, we weren't trying to say, can we contribute higher spatial resolution data to the air pollution models? That's a great thing to do, but you need to go out and deploy lots of sensors. And you need to get something that's actually air quality relevant deployed on, and that's a really hard problem. It's easy to get the data. It's hard to actually get air quality health relevant data. And we said, you know, look, the people who do the air pollution models based on the big instruments they have, it's not perfect, but they have pretty sophisticated models. They have a collection of instruments. It's influenced by weather patterns as well. And they run this big computation to estimate uh, the smog alert, to estimate the spatial distribution of that pollution that's coming off largely the big diesel trucks on the highways. And so based on how far you are from the highway and which way the wind is blowing, they will estimate your exposure. And then I can use my time series of exactly where I've been and over time to look at my exposure by taking my time series as an index, if you will, into that spatiotemporal model. And uh, so that's what this uh, project uh, PEER was about. And that really began that next pivot to focus on mobile health and on not just, you know, as the, as the teens in their community using their, their phone as a way of collecting data to, to develop uh, data to make a case about something in their environment. Where should they put the youth center, right? Where should they try to put a, a healthy alternative uh, 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 food establishment? But really to start to collect evidence about myself. And so we started this, if you will, this notion of looking <coughs> at the data that my mobile, and truthfully, the other digital services I used, what do, what do those digital traces, what can they tell me about me, right? What can they tell you about you? What can they tell you about your, 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 elder, person, your elder parent living at home who's having some change in medication? Um, how can we start to have this sort of N equals me evidence base? We tend to think of medical evidence as coming from big, randomized trials, you want them to be big so that the chance of a finding having applicability to the population is greater, right? You have, um, uh, 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 you have much better confidence in your results. But there's also this question of now that we're all instrumented, we can create our own evidence base that's just about us and help that inform our process. And so um, this is just a, a, a screenshot um, from that, uh, not just as within peer, sort of taking my time location trace and looking at it with, with reference to a, a, a pollution model, but here, now that I can, by running a, some software on the background on an Android phone, and it's iOS is, is catching up, uh, I can have a continuous activity location trace. 
And that physical activity is relevant to things like we talk about with Fitbit and the OP and Nike Plus in terms of motivating healthy behavior. But it's also very telling in terms of what our, uh, uh, what our function is about as we're being treated. So the big picture of this, uh, this uh, part of mobile health is that we have the ability to capture some through self-report, but increasingly through passively collected data because we mediate our lives with these mobile devices. And so our symptoms, side effects, outcome measures, our actions are, are increasingly turning into data that are recorded that are there for the processing. Most of the work in all of this isn't really mobile. There's some UI there. There are some interesting challenges. But most of this is, in fact, as we found with SENS and embedded sensing, it's mostly about the data. It's mostly the heavy lifting is being done in the cloud. And then, and a lot of the UI challenges are actually, some of them are in the engagement pieces around capturing the data, and a lot of them are, are in actually bringing this back in an actionable way back to the end user who might be a clinician, who might be um, a patient. And so we focused very much on chronic disease management. And that question is why? Um, well, uh, as with many things that I do, it's opportunistic, right? That's where the fact that we're all instrumented out of the clinical setting that's where we can fill a gap that's the biggest. The opportunity to get systematic data from people when they're not seeing the doctor, when they're not in the hospital. But it's actually an important problem. So lifestyle behaviors still are significantly responsible for, uh, for mortality. More than, uh, by now, more than half Americans have one or more chronic disease. That's not 50% of American patients. That's just 50%. Um, of Americans. And the age of onset is getting younger and younger. Uh, World Economic Forum has some numbers that are just too big to even process about how the non-communicable diseases, not, to, not the in infectious disease is still important, but the non-communicable diseases are costing worldwide over the next 20 years huge amount mental health on top of that. And so the idea of being able to equip us to better uh, prevent uh, and treat and manage those diseases um, is a compelling problem. And so we think about it in the context of individuals being able to catch, capture data on themselves more systematically, can feed their self-care, OK? Is this supplement that you're taking for early stage arthritis actually working for you, right? Changes are subtle. There's a lot of day-to-day -day vari variation. There are confounding factors. It's hard to do that based just on subjective um, recall, which is basically what happens um, now. Clinical care also relies tremendous amount on self-report. There are things that can be measured in the blood, okay? High blood pressure. Take your high blood pressure medication, you come into the doctor's office, they check your blood pressure. Yes, of course, your blood pressure in the doctor's office is higher than it is on the street, but that's okay. They're always checking it in the doctor's office, right? So it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's not a bad source of in-person variance over time to see whether, in fact, now your blood pressure in the doctor's office is lower than it used to be. Some people will argue that we overmanage high blood pressure, where we, we give people too much high blood pressure medication because we're always checking their blood pressure in the doctor's office where their blood pressure is always elevated. People will argue the same thing around uh, diabetes, that we're overly fixated with type 2 diabetes on managing blood glucose. And we, cause pe we give people too much insulin, which makes them unable to lose weight and causes them to gain weight, which is only making the whole problem worse. So that you can measure something can make something worse, not better, right? There's still a lot of uh, clinical insight and learning that needs to be done. But the, I, but, the, but the point is that we have the ability to um, bring together uh, a rich set of data around an individual with smart processing of that data to really better inform how is that person adapting to uh, the treatment that they have. And uh, so doctors have known for a long time that they wish they had data in between clinical visits. They wish they had data that wasn't just, how are you feeling? Are you having more symptoms? Um, how are you adhering? But we just haven't had everybody instrumented before. And then finally, we also, you know, medical doctors are not supposed to be creative when they're treating you. They're supposed to be evidence-based. And we haven't had evidence-based 
about the variability. You, doctors know what they prescribe, but they don't know what we end up doing. Um, and they know what we tell them and what they can measure when we come in clinically, but we don't know what's going on otherwise. And so the opportunity to actually create systematic data-based evidence at the level of the individuals um, is potentially transformative. And, and my, my co-founder of OpenM Health, who's a real doctor, um, uh, I, I stole this uh, slide from her and, and Rich Kravitz, uh, another uh, MD colleague, because I really think it captures this notion of how this can change how we think about our own care and why I sort of say having research be a part of everyday life. So the traditional way of generating um, uh, evidence, as I mentioned before, is you do a randomized control trial. You have some complex of exposures and you randomize 50% to one treatment and 50% to another and you see what are the results. This is just an example with respect to, uh, to antidepressants. And so then you find that one drug works much better for people 75% of the time. And then, as Ida says, she's a real doctor, right? When Mr. Jones is sitting in front of her, though, she doesn't know if he's part of the 75% or the 25%. Now, if you're doing intensive chemo or radiation, or you're doing surgery, non-reversal medical things, well, you just simply have to go off of the best data. But if you're putting somebody on antidepressants that they're going to be on for the next five years, right? You could take two or three months to figure out what works better for them. And so the opportunity to put somebody on one thing, do a lot of passive measurement around how they're actually doing, right? When somebody's being given antidepressants, what time are they getting out, and out of the house in the morning? What time are they getting to work? How is their sleep management going? How are their communication patterns going? There are lots of these functional things. None of it is measured measurable at this point in a blood-based or saliva-based measurement. It maybe eventually we'll see it in brain mapping, right? But we're a ways, uh, a, a ways to get there as well. So you can do this kind of what get evidence for Mr. Jones about what works better uh, uh, for him. So um, this uh, led us uh, over a, a, uh, now a few years ago. Um, I started working with uh, Ida Sim on seeing that there is an opportunity to do this kind of personal precision-based data capture to inform clinical and self-care treatment across a wide, wide range of uh, chronic diseases. Depression, diabetes, Crohn's disease, more general GI issues, arthritis, um, memory disorders, uh, lots of things in the in rheumatology context, lupus, MS, things where people, it's, uh, there are flare-ups that people don't understand, but they do have a sense that there are personal exposures, exposures being things they do, things they eat, um, that uh, uh, how they manage their drugs, things that let them manage those flare-ups better, reduce them in number, reduce them in severity, reduce them in duration. So um, we... Um, in particular, um, me uh, having been basically raised uh, uh, career-wise, right, in that open community, right? The thing that really influenced the way I think about everything is those years I spent around the ITF and the internet community, right? That that's how you get um, an, incre you know, an incredibly vibrant market of services and products, and that's how the internet changed the world, not by a closed siloed architecture, but by a huge amount of modularity and open interfaces and such. And so we, um, in the mobile health context, from depression to diabetes to all these disorders, we saw a huge amount of silos happening and everybody recreating. It's a good idea. And so good idea, people all go to that thing and start recreating one at a time, and health IT is notorious for being anything but open modular architecture. And so we started OpenM Health, and um, we have done a number of uh, different sort of case studies. This is just an example of one that just says, if you want to do, this was about a type 1 diabetes management. You want to do type 1 diabetes management, don't start from scratch building everything. There are blood glucose monitors, but people now actually want to bring in physical activity because that influences what's going on in in um, insulin production and, and, your, and blood glucose management, mood and affect 
are important as well. Don't go off and create yet another mood and affect monitoring app. Be able to use the one that's there. And so we think about, um, about mobile health as there are lots of data streams that we generate. And in fact, um, apps generate a data stream. It's because the analytics of how you use an app is a source of, of data as well. And so when you think about apps as data streams and self-report as data streams and instruments as data streams and passive collection off the sensors on the phone as data streams, as I said before, it's really a problem that is not just about a mobile app. It has much more to do with data analysis and really the challenges are around sense making. How do you take all this messy disparate sources of data and turn them into some kind of robust marker that's relevant to, uh, uh, to health? So in that example, uh, there are these, there are people want to hear about real sensors. You hear about sensors and data stream and health, people want to see physical devices. And they are important, okay? These physical devices that measure particular physiological parameters. But I think that there's a tremendous amount of data that we generate in our daily lives that are also tremendously uh, telling and important that when we bring them together with, in some cases, these physical uh, devices, it's very interesting. And there's a, a startup called Ginger.io, it's a spin-off of MIT, that is very much in this space, um, very interesting to look at. They collect a bunch of data. Again, it's Android-based because that's been the place that, that one can do this sort of thing. And they generate a kind of check engine light around, uh, health, around adherence and health management. So one of the big, uh, uh, that we know from previous studies is that depression, uh, a, a, a depression in type 2 diabetics is a big problem. The, when, dep when depression hits, management of diabetes is much, uh, 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 adherence and management of blood glucose is much worse and then you get into one of these bad positive uh, feedback loops. And so Ginger IO collects a bunch of parameters are off of phone usage. Your communication patterns, your overall mobility, they crunch it into a kind of a check engine light for how you're doing. And so we used, uh, and, and they're a private startup, right? They have a commercial funding. They have their secret sauce is in there doing their clever machine learning approach to taking this data and coming up with your check engine light. But in doing mobile health, as we know from the internet, you can take the commercial with the open, and it's about combining these things together and moving things uh, uh, forward. And so in this example for exa uh, of, our, of our type 1 diabetes case, we took blood glucose measurements, we took Qualcomm's TuneNet, you took a, a weight scale that connects to it, we took Ginger IO, we took background mobility, this is the same thing you saw before, where we're just measuring on the Android and gives you more specific information about your, your physical activity. A very cool app um, from somebody who's now a colleague at Cornell, but this was, I wasn't involved with this, called Photographic Affect Meter, where in many contexts you want to measure something about mood or affect, and there's a traditional way that the psychologists do this. And um, J.P. Pollock came up with an image-based way that he actually proved that it has the same uh, robustness and validity that you get from a traditional uh, sort of a Likert scale multi-point uh, answering of questions where people just use a, select the image that represents their affect at the time. Much more appealing to do and actually he's done by the side-by-side -side studies. And so when you do that, your affect becomes a data stream that comes into this um, mixed um, uh, thing and then we did a little uh, tool for the individual to let them look at how their mood correlates with their physical activity, how their mood relates to their blood adherence, um, to give the person back some uh, closer feedback to be more systematic about their own management um, and also gave some data back to uh, their clinician so that the clinician can start to understand like why is one week the food intake is the same. Type 1 diabetics have to enter all their carbo load into their pumps, right? That's the only way they stay alive is by getting the right amount of insulin to correspond to what they're eating. Uh, but one week it's working and another week it isn't. Well, one of the unmeasured mysteries there is, amount of, is the, about the amount of physical activity that somebody's doing. And so we bring that in and let the clinician also begin to better manage around that variability uh, in physical activity. Um, Alex, who was one of our test patients in this, found that for her, doing these spurts of very intensive physical activity were actually much more problematic in managing her blood glucose. And she was better off doing more moderate 
exercise. That's not necessarily one you, what you want to give to somebody who, um, uh, to the general population, but for her, it was a very important insight to get to a place of better management. If, you don't, if you're type 1 diabetic and you don't manage your blood glucose, you really start to destroy your, uh, your organs. It's a, it's, not, it's a very serious issue. So as we've moved on in this, uh, in this space, the, one of the biggest challenges is about taking these messy sources of data and turning them into what I started calling sort of behavioral biomarkers for chronic disease. So we have serum-based biomarkers, right? We check things in the blood. We check things in the saliva. We check your, your, your blood pressure. We have physical biomarkers that are very important in telling clinicians, are we going in the right direction? Is this treatment effective? Do we have to up your blood pressure dosage? Oh, you're dizzy, you're having dizziness side effects. Can we actually lower it and still be keeping your blood pressure at a level that you're not causing your body, uh, your body harm? We want to bring into this these other measures. So if you're, an, um, if you're uh, trying to titrate your chronic pain medication, okay, chronic pain medication is a huge issue in this country. It's overused um, in many contexts. It's given to an individual and they're told take as needed. What is as needed, right? If you overtake pain medication, you become, um, you become, it both has addiction issues and you become more sedentary. If you undertake it, you're debilitated by your pain. So take as needed is not don't take. How do you and the clinician actually begin to uh, determine that balance between the interference of the pain and the management of the pain? So we've started doing explorations around in this continuous data that we have, what are the parameters that a clinician wants to see over time to see if they are to, to in that feedback loop, right? Drug treat, medical treatment is an optimization problem, right? With a feedback loop. You give somebody a treatment, you collect data, you increase, you decrease, and basically the feedback loop has been impoverished in terms of the underlying data. So we now are bringing back to these chronic pain management folks, okay, since you put them on this, uh, since they're actually trying to reduce their amount of chronic pain medication, what time are they getting out of the house in the morning? How many hours are they spending out of the house each day? Have they pulled back so far that it's really reducing their amount of time out of the house? It's interfering with their ability of their everyday activities. How long are they walking every day? There's a standard clinical measure of a six-minute walk. You bring them to the doctor's office and you walk them around the doctor's office. How many times do they go around? Within six minutes. We can now get that in situ from people and in their natural context to see what they're actually doing. And so we're right now in this phase of really working across different uh, chronic diseases, and the biomarker that you're going to get for depression is going to be different from the one you're going to get for rheumatoid arthritis is going to be somewhat different for the one you're going to do for um, um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, where people also have issues of feeling safe enough to be out of the house, numbers of hours that, uh, that they're able to be, uh, to be out of the house. But all the underlying technical pieces are very much the same. So, we collect that data, we do lower level state classification, different kinds of summarization, and then work a lot with the clinicians to figure out what's really relevant to a particular uh, uh, situation. And some of this comes from physical activity, but some of it comes from people's use of apps. Um, so these data streams are from both the physiological measure, the activity measures, as well as um, uh, uses of apps themselves. And so, um, as we sort of still are computer scientists in the end, so coming up with more generalizable tools to let us do this. Because when you sit down with these clinicians, you need to collect some data. They need to look through, and they, they haven't had these measures before. They're not just coming up with another instrument to do what they already do in the lab. They need to iterate and see in the data where you get something that's robust enough that is actually telling them something over time. And so that's the phase we're in now, which is really having, we have modularity in our analysis stack. We sit down with these clinicians to try to bring them some data and figure out what's, uh, what's relevant and to use this to create these uh, behavioral biomarkers. Once we have them, these things um, both are feedback to the clinician. They're also potential feedback into things like uh, the behavior-based incentives that you want to bring to individuals. The early work that happened in this space by Sonny Consalvo and James Landay at UW and Intel on UBFIT Still really great seminal project in this space where, um, where they showed that it wasn't the detail of the instrument that you had somebody carry around with them with the precision with which it measured their physical activity that mattered in whether measuring and giving feedback mattered. It was this lovely dynamic 
background ambient display that they designed that as you met your physical objectives for the day, it grew flowers in your garden. OK, some people don't like flowers on their background screen. In a more uh, modern incarnation of this, Tanzim Chowdhury has a version of this where it's a more, uh, if you will, gender neutral uh, fish aquarium. Um, but the notion of bringing into our ambient displays, driving the feedback we get off of what we're actually doing, is some of this goes to the straight clinical, but some of this could go, you could have your, you know, the powers of your avatar and some, you know, virtual multiplayer game thing be driven off of how much you actually move, right? You could have your profile on a dating website actually reflect who you are and what you do, not some just uh, a, a notion of what you want to project, whether anyone would want to do that or not. But I do think there's a, um, I mentioned that, I know somebody who started one of the early um, dating websites, and I suggested this, like, you know, maybe it would be sort of neat that on these websites, I was trying to make converse, I was trying to relate to him, so I was like, not that I have any particular interest in this space. But um, <laughs> I said, you know, you could get these people to stop lying about who they are, right? You say you're an active individual. Well, let me see your trace from the last three weeks, right? Are you active in your mind or are you actually active, right? You could do matches. And all he was interested in was, you know what? We have all these fraud problems. We have people coming in from other countries and using our dating sites to actually um, engage people in fraud. And so why would I want them for is for fraud detection. Anyway, um, that's what I get for trying to make uh, dinnertime conversation. Uh, one of the interesting things, as I, as I get to the end here, one of the interesting things in this space is that I think there's really nice alignment between um, filtering the data in order for it to be actionable and filtering it in order for it to be acceptable. So there's sort of this notion of this too much information filter. And um, I would hope some of you, like it occurred to you, even though I didn't mention it, some of you got a little bit of a sense of, I don't know if I want to be continuously tracked, right? Well, and as a, if you say this to clinicians, any clinicians in the audience? So if you say this to clinicians, what they really don't want to do is to track you. They don't want that information. It's way too much information to them. It's overwhelming. It's liability. They don't have enough time that it is, right? They have three minutes, you know, to interact with you face to face. The last thing they need is to see a whole bunch of detailed uh, data. So in this process of, of summarizing this data, I think there's a really nice symbiotic need between too much information from a, from a person's perspective, too much information from a usability perspective, that we want to filter out and pull out the features that are relevant. You're having insomnia problems, then you share sleep data that has to do with, um, that has to do with the, the temporal patterns of your sleep. It doesn't, your clinician doesn't need to know where you're sleeping. You're having allergy problems that are relevant uh, to sleep. Well, then context can actually uh, begin, to, begin to matter. But we can choose to share for a functional reason what is relevant uh, to the action at hand. So I see this, if you will, as sort of a third pillar in personalized and precision medicine. We know we hear a lot about big data, EHRs and web mining, really cool stuff coming out of Microsoft Research recently where they did web mining and discovered adverse effects of a medication that had never been known by seeing that people talked about the medication and then this side effect that they were having. Uh, there's all the omics, right? Nomics, proteomics, and huge amount that, that algorithms and data analysis had played there. But there's also this small data around our mobile health and digital traces that I think is in, uh, uh, going to be this sort of third important pillar of where uh, IT comes a lot into health. I mentioned um, Open M Health and bringing that notion of modularity and open interfaces to this space. Um, and I just want to end with some of sort of what's next um, in this uh, trajectory. We're forming a kind of um, M Health greenhouse, if you will. So this is pre-incubator, sort of pre-NIH proposal. Clinicians have a lot of ideas about how they would like to be able to help their patients in between those clinical visits. But there's sort of no way to explore those ideas. Some of those ideas are good. Some of them are science fiction still, right? And some of them, you know, won't really work or the noise data is too noisy or is hard to do. And so we want to create a place where people can sort of easily, not with big N, not with big studies, come in and try something out on a patient or two and iterate in the way that we have all so successfully 
moved um, computer science and the web and the internet and all that forward is we do a lot of tight iteration loops. And clinicians don't have a chance to do that. If they have an idea, they have to write an NIH proposal, which means that they have to do a larger study for the most part. Or if they have an idea, they have to go and, and take it out to a venture capitalist and they have to have a, some you know, revenue context. So not surprising, uh, healthcare is expensive. Innovations have to make money. Okay, how do we make room for innovations that don't make money, that save money, <laughs> that are practical? Where do we get, the, you know, that supplements are actually a way to manage disease? To, in whose interest is it possibly of interest to run those studies? And so I think there's an opportunity to do a more frugal kind of technology uh, development in this space um, that's particularly exciting. And then secondly, moving out uh, beyond just mobile as our sources of data to all the other digital traces we generate in the world. I'm really interested in bringing back your digital trace to you, right? So that you could, all the personalization and targeted advertising and system improvement that all of your internet services do, from search to social to mobile to e-commerce to game playing, if you could get just your data feeds back about you, not because you're a quantified selfer and you're going to put them into you know, R and start doing analysis, but because you're going to feed them off to apps that are going to run over them. So the notion of having personal data APIs and creating a new market of apps and services that will run over that data, I think there's a lot of interesting potential there. So working on a, using New York City as an interesting test bed with more diversity than, than, than just doing um, experiments on the students we find on a campus, which is all good too. But um, uh, taking advantage of my new uh, context in New York City. And so I think I am just uh, at time and to say what I mentioned at the beginning that I was, you know, grew up in this context of end-to-end -end arguments and system design. I'm sure this paper and this, at least that, com that, that phrase is familiar to, uh, to some of you. And what I've learned from this last uh, decade and a half is that there's really an end-to-end -end argument to take on authentic applications in driving our systems work. And because it really keeps you failing early, a conceptual idea that sounds good, generates an interesting reason to do an interesting algorithm, but actually doesn't fit uh, what's needed. And getting feedback that gives you ideas that you just never would have had before. And so from a systems perspective, I'm a real fan of taking on what the, uh, you know, the STC process uh, let us actually do, which is really bringing in those authentic applications um, into, the, into the design room, if you will. And that's it. Never throw it away. You just share less. Okay. So I'm really glad you said that because um, just as we found with you know remote sensing, right? NASA has these massive images, and as the algorithms became better and better, there's so much more you can improve the what you extract. So what's really interesting in this space, if we do it right, is that our private data, raw data, can be in a personal data container in the cloud, and what we extract from it, right, is what we know to extract at the time. But never throw data away. That doesn't mean that I have to share, even though our internet services have turned out that way, right? That the minute we do anything, that data is shared, right? There can be, as I bring all this data together in one place, right? It's a bit of a political statement, right? I could do that in a way that is really in a private container in the cloud, and then what I share is what's needed at the time. But it's there to be remined later. But what I'm interested in is the fact that the part you don't want to share may be the part that's essential to understand a fundamental theoretical problem. And so you appeal to people to actually 
we donate blood, you can donate data. You appeal to people to engage in that, in that process, right? But by virtue of just, uh, you know, I think that there is, this stuff is just too telling. It, I, that, the, and, and too easily processed, much more so than like, you know, cameras on the London subway. I mean, that's pretty easy. Uh, uh, by now more and more easily processed. But you have my location trace, my time series of my location. You more or less know everything about me. <laughs> I think you'll get lots of people to donate it before then, right? But you don't, you, you, don't, you don't need the whole population. But to get this stuff used in practice, right, you, I think we do need the ability for people to selectively Share, randomized controlled trials are not over the whole population. <laughs> we invented legislation <laughs> barriers, what do you mean? Um, and litigious barriers, right? It's not even so much legislation barriers, it's the, it's the threat of liability and lawsuits and litigious barriers. So, um, uh, so many things involved in your, in your comment. And um, you, first you started with that uh, investments in Internet of Things, right, in those companies largely went bankrupt. So I am not making a plea right now necessarily either about Internet of Things nor about um, uh, venture capital investments necessarily, particularly in those, particu in those individual devices. I think devices are great as we have them and there'll be great new improvements over time. But my story is largely about things for which we don't need new devices, but which we're culling information and inferences out of use of technologies that people actually won't let you take away from them even if you try, okay? And I'm not saying all physiological things. Sometimes you need particular sensors, right? So I just, um, it will also, things take time to work through, to go through a workflow process, right? This whole question of clinicians, huge numbers of clinicians and people on their behalf say it's too much information for them. It's more liability, it's more time, right? But that's also, it needs to be something that really is informative to them. It'll take us time to show that it's informative, right? We have to get down to that thing that's really going to help them in better management of a condition. So we're working even with pharmaceutical companies. Some of the pharmaceutical companies get that there's not just going to be that patient insert that none of us read that goes along with the medication. Stay out of the sun, avoid dairy, watch for this side effect and tell your doctor if this happens, right? Your doctor is going to prescribe an app to you 
or a set of apps that when you're on a new medication for a couple of weeks, you're going to be doing some kind of monitoring through self-report or other things that's going to be that feedback piece back to your clinician about whether they need to up your dose, uh, reduce it, or change it. So this stuff takes time. Tons of things with FDA, with HIPAA, with all these things, but I don't, but I think they are surmountable. We simply have to show where this stuff is valuable and where it isn't in particular. But I don't think it all starts with devices. And so I love the Internet of Things, but I think there is a, such a, uh, a focus from the beginning on the thing um, that some of this bigger story of what we can leverage off of data that we're already generating um, is missed a little bit. Time for one more? Yeah. And I would just say, I think it's all going to happen, but can we make it happen in a way that is in addition to the fact that the rental car companies and the insurance companies, they're not going to require it. No problem. Pay more for your premium, right? So, right, those people who can't afford it will have no choice, right? But to comply, and then most of us will just do it anyway, right? But in addition, can you get it back so that you can get feedback on how you're actually uh, how you're actually driving, right? That your gas consumption be, re be reduced by 10% if you would stop speeding up to those stop signs. And, you know, in the way that we, some of us, you know, in the early days of the Prius when it was that first bit of feedback, right? There were, you can, when your teenager is going out to start to learn to drive, right, that you can actually see data on how they're progressing, right, in their, based on some metric of, you know, these are safe driving parameters. There are things that we can use these for, not just that, they can be used, you know, and, and I think that's what I'm saying about all these things are going to happen. But can we also think about getting these data back for things that we'd like to use them for, not just that they're used in aggregate or, you know, related to our, our payment systems and such. 